Good morning and welcome to Georgetown Presbyterian Church this morning via my remote setting at home in Myrtle Beach. As you can see behind me, I have a candle burning for Advent and a nativity scene and above a wonderful Christmas wreath. It's the third Sunday in Advent, and today's celebration would have had us in the sanctuary lighting the third candle of Advent, which for us would be the joy candle. Why do we have Advent wreaths and candles anyway? I thought I might take a moment in this unique setting today to tell you about the beginnings of the Advent wreath. In the mid-1800s, research has shown that a German Lutheran pastor by the name of Johann Weigerd did his ministry in an urban setting among the poor. One of those outreach ministries of which he was a part was a mission house for disadvantaged children. As he began to make his way through the days of Advent leading up to Christmas, the children would ask, how many more days to Christmas? How many more days till Christmas? Until finally, Reverend Ike Weikard decided, I'll help them visually and we'll make us something that we can chart the days to Christmas. And so he found an old cartwheel, and he dressed it up, and he put 24 candles on it. And beginning with December 1, he would light a candle. And then Advent 2, a second, and a third, so that the children could see how many days there were remaining until Christmas time. On the appropriate days for the Sundays, Reverend Weikard would put a larger white candle around that wreath, and it would signify the celebration of a given Sabbath day. That experience began what we know as lighting the Advent candles. And now, generally, most churches embrace the themes of hope, and peace, and joy, and love. And today, the candle that we're lighting is indeed the candle of joy. Okay, that's enough of a history lesson, maybe even History Lesson 101 on Advent candles and the wreaths. Oh, by the way, at some point, someone also noted that that wreath also looked like a crown. And so there are many celebrations of lighting the Advent crown, which points to and symbolizes the birth of the child king at Bethlehem. On a dreary day like today, when churches all around up and down the coast have canceled their services, my heart was drawn to our two readings of the day. One would have been from Nehemiah 8. It was a time when the Israelites, who had been in exile from Babylon, came home and they had rebuilt the walls, and Nehemiah with the scribe Ezra began to turn their attentions to rebuilding the spiritual lives of the children of Israel. The second reading would have come from 1 Peter today with those wonderful words that talk about a joy that is in Christ, that is indescribable with words. Both of these lessons are important. So a quick look at the joy of the Lord as Nehemiah discussed it. The particular verse that drew my attention was the one that reads thusly, The joy of the Lord is our strength. 
I want to talk about that for just a moment, and I, if I may. When I picture strength, what comes to my mind is something like a well-sculpted body that can run swiftly and lift heavy things, or even a financial portfolio that can withstand economic ripples, a house that is well-built and sturdy, or a relationship that can withstand hardship and difficulty. Nehemiah, the author of the Old Testament book of the same name, writes, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is the last word that I might typically associate with strength. Joy seems like a, more like a description of a five-year-old dancing around at a birthday party who's been eating vanilla ice cream covered with multicolored sprinkles. When at a moment, mom might say, okay, we've eaten all the sweets we can stand. Let's go brush our teeth. We don't want cavities from the sugar. And the joy that was so wonderfully expressed began to die away as the five-year-old turned the joy dance into a temper tantrum. Not now, Mommy. I'm enjoying the ice cream. Nehemiah's words are striking when you consider the context. For the Israelites had been living with terrible destruction and hardship and heartache. Jerusalem had been destroyed by Babylon's king, Nebuchadnezzar, and many Jews were still living in Babylon, and some of them already committed to worshiping other gods. So when the exiles came home, their lives had been destroyed. And the whole point of Nehemiah's message was to help them understand their sin and their falling away from God and the need to repent and come back to God. It caused the children of Israel to weep bitterly over their sins, knowing full well that their God had been with them, even though the hardships and the circumstances had robbed them of their joy. At that very moment, in the midst of their weeping, Nehemiah says, Come on now, let's consider just how wonderful God's blessings are. You go home and eat and drink, and share your eating and your drinking with those who have no food or drink, and enjoy this day. Your confessions have been heard, for this is a sacred day now, a new beginning, if you will, for indeed the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now the situation was about as bad as it could get, but Nehemiah's words about joy brought them to a new place. Sometimes it's easy to say, oh, just be joyful in the Lord, your hardships will go away. And it's not just a feeling that surfaces. We really have to understand that when we know Christ and his love for us, that produces in us a joy that is not based on the circumstance in which we find ourselves. More importantly, the joy of Christ's presence in our lives becomes the source of enduring toughness that enables us to endure any hardship or difficulty we might face, whether that's a sickness or a troubled relationship with a spouse or some news about cancer. The joy of the Lord is not an escape from the matter. It is a way through the matter.
And joy is cultivated every time we lean deeper on our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, it's easy to be joyful when things are going well, when we praise God for his goodness and his provision and his protection. But real joy is learned and developed and cultivated during hardships and difficult times. We may not feel like praising or celebrating God when things are difficult, but this is precisely the time when the Lord is able to overwhelm our hearts and our minds and our spirits because joy is who Christ is. I'm asking you to consider if you're moving through a difficult time to reach out to the gift of Christ that is present in our world. Embrace him and embracing him, no matter your outward circumstance, it is that embracing of the eternal Christ that gives us joy, strength, toughness to make it through the difficult times. And now finally, a quick word about joy that Peter says is inexpressible and indescribable beyond our human words. Advent finds us heading to a manger cradling the God of the universe in baby form, embracing the Lord of the cosmos wrapped in swaddling clothes, admiring the great physician holding heaven's prescription for the salvation of humankind. This baby is the great I am. There are just simply no words to describe such sovereign majesty in its natural state. Only one thing comes to mind. Only one thing abides when in the company of the eternal in human form. And that, to me, is joy, inexpressible joy, a thanksgiving that in the darkness of Advent's winter, the light of Jesus Christ has come. Won't you embrace that light? And as you do, remember even though it's difficult and almost beyond words to describe that joy, it is nevertheless present, holding you and embracing you today and tomorrow and forever. Joy. Thanks be to God. And may you continue to celebrate with us when next week we will have two services on Christmas Eve, the 10.30 a.m. service and our 5.30 p.m. candlelight service. May the joy of Christ be yours today.